Hello, hello everybody. My name is Kate Marin and I am a argument and research specialist at the Debate Boutique. Um, I mostly specialize in postmodernism and critical theory. So today I will be talking about Berkeley Prep Casey's take on psychoanalysis, or I guess debunking their take on psychoanalysis. Um, so anyway, let's get going. Um, so before, oh, I'm really in the way of the slide, position of the unconscious. Okay, so before I kind of get into like the nitty gritty and particularly the debate aspects of this, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about both the historical context of psychoanalysis um, and like how that is situated within debate. So one really important concept that probably deserves a little bit of explanation is this quote, the unconscious is structured like a language. Um, so this was Lacan. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about like what that means. So this is a very common kind of thesis level claim. And it was subject to what amounts to a, I hesitate to call it a translation error, um, more so like translations are imperfect, language is already imperfect. Um, but in Romance languages, and I am going to use Spanish as an example because I don't speak French, but in Romance languages, there are two words um, to describe language. You have lengua and lenguaje, and they refer to different things. But when those things are translated into English, you lose the second word, lenguaje, and you're left with language. So lengua is in reference to a particular language, so like French or Spanish or English or German or Mandarin, whatever it might be. Um, lenguaje is kind of the closest translation is the capacity to have language in the first place. Um, and so in linguistics, this is like when you, um, when you hear about like universalists like Chomsky or structuralists, um, this is kind of the basis of the biological um, argument that language is biological or innate. Um, and this argument is founded on the idea that there are certain patterns um, and kind of form, at the level of form as opposed to content that are repeated across all languages. And something that you'll see um, particularly like when children are learning to speak a language is that they make the same kinds of mistakes, that those mistakes may be the same in form even if they're not in content. And this is heavily debated and every couple of years we discover a new language that breaks Chomsky's set of rules and he has to rewrite his whole theory again. Um, I don't know that I would call myself a linguistic structuralist, um, but Lacan um, definitely is coming at this question from that perspective that there is kind of a set of rules and guidelines and principles and um, patterns that dictate our relationship to language. So things like um, word order and agreement and um, conjugations, and I won't get into the linguistic nitty gritty of that because I would talk about it forever. Um, but the reason that this is important is that Lacan isolates the um, the moment of like it, the subject's induction into the symbolic order or like relationship to the symbolic order, the formation of the unconscious, the moment of loss as um, the kind of foundational introduction into the sphere of language. So your unconscious or kind of your existence as a thinking subject is only developed at the moment that you encounter the symbolic, um, which is the realm of language. And so in that way, the um, kind of the unconscious, the mental space of the subject can only be understood via the same patterns and relationships that exist in language um, because those two things were formed simultaneously. They're like co-constitutive um, and they reflect off of each other. And so this means that um, semiotics, which is kind of the study, is a subsect of linguistics, becomes really important for understanding how the subject operates and understands and relates to the world, because each of those things can be comprehended through a linguistic paradigm. Uh, so with that in mind, a quick kind of overview. So I'm going to give a little bit of history. I'll use that to frame the debate arguments, and then we'll get into actual debunking um, so some quick history. So why are we still talking about Freud um, and Lacan and Zizek? Why are they relevant? Why do we care? So Freud is relevant because he revolutionized the field of psychology. And say what you will, I have a very strong personal distaste for Freud, um, but he did do this. Um, when 
Freud comes into the psychology scene, there is a preference towards what's called behaviorism. And this is the idea that all of a subject's behavior is due to responses, immediate responses to external stimuli that cause a neurological impulse that cause a predictable behavior. Um, and the reason that this was the predominant paradigm is because what came before was a kind of ridiculous take on like introspective self-determination of like certain like subconscious feelings. And it was so whack that all of psychology was like, nah, we're gonna look at numbers for a little while. So Freud pulls up and is like, hey, I know that the first theory was whack, but like definitely there are things about the mind that cannot be objectively and directly studied with only empirical data. And so he comes up with some theories and I'll talk a little bit more about like the in the smaller component pieces of like this process um, on later slides. Um, but the major thing that Freud does is kind of bring the idea of the unconscious um, back into the discussion of the subject within psychology. And some have said that he reinvigorated the field by being so wrong and out of pocket that everybody wrote to respond to him. Not everyone agrees with me, or that's not actually my take only, but not everyone agrees with that. So I'll leave that up to you. Um, but in any case, the other things that Freud introduces um, are the idea of the Oedipi, uh, la, 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 the Oedipal um, triangle, the Oedipus complex, um, the again, the idea of the unconscious, and um, the idea of the kind of development of the child in stages, so things like the oral and the anal stage, to explain um, childhood development. Um, and then also, the he is kind of at the beginning of talk therapy as a way of dealing with what he describes as neuroses and psychoses. Um, so following this, Lacan pulls up and is like, okay, Freud did some problematic things. Um, a lot of them are deeply tied to like the Oedipus complex. Um, there's some biological essentialism, misogyny, anti-queerness, ableism. Again, we'll talk about author indicts later. Um, but Lacan said, okay, what if it was all like low key kind of a metaphor? Like not really, but like, it's definitely about language, right? And kind of tries to rescue the parts of Freud that he thinks are like valid. Um, so he is responsible for introducing things like the death drive and um, kind of further fleshing out concepts of like lack and desire and particularly the mi mirror stage, which I've already discussed. Then we've got Zizek who has described his project as a return to Hegel through Lacan to reinvigorate Marx. I will let you sit with that as a sentence. Um, his major contributions are a critique of like progress and like positivist progress and research paradigms and ideology, um, which is the idea kind of that ideology is the imposition of an external will, not to use Nietzsche's language, um, or like an authority. So actually in the, in the language of psychoanalysis, um, like the idea of mastery, um, and then also um, for, or Gigi, excuse me, is um, an accelerationist, which again, we'll come up later. So in the context of debate, um, oh no, my slide got all messed up. Anyway, um, how does it work? Why is it strategic? So I've broken the critique in my head, at least into four like major parts, thesis link impact alt. So the thesis level explanation of like most psychoanalysis critiques and Berkeley's, Berkeley Prep's critique is not um, distinct from this thesis claim is that the subject is characterized by a desire for wholeness um, that at the moment of the initial moment of loss the introduction and it's symbolic into language um, that there is kind of the imposition or the figuration of lack that there is um, something that is now kind of missing um, and that initial loss um, situates our desire so we desire to return to the moment of wholeness um, but we cannot really fill this lack. And the reason for that is because the lack is defined by its non-existence. There is no actual object that is lacking. Um, there is only the moment of loss itself. And so because of this, we're seeking something that like cannot be had, it doesn't exist. And when we get it, um, or like, and I, I say that kind of in air quotes, like when we get it, but like the object of desire, the thing that we think will fill the lack, um, it ceases to be lacking. And so something else fills that space. Um, and so the other kind of major like thesis level arguments um, are primarily the death drive and kind of joissance. So 
joissance is the pleasure that we feel when violating a taboo, we're doing something we aren't supposed to do. Um, and the kind of one of the characterizations of this is the enjoyment of the kind of pursuit of wholeness or in a lot of the evidence that Berkeley Prep is using, um, this is called like the good with a capital G. Um, so the death drive kind of is characterized by the desire not for the object of loss itself, but for the pursuit of that object. And so this leads to things like self-sabotage and masochism and what their evidence describes explicitly as like the enjoyment of trauma. So the next level of the critique is the link. And this is one of the things that makes psychoanalysis so strategic. And like, again, this shell is no exception. The link level is this, you desire blank or solve blank or pursue blank as a form of progress. If your 1AC has impacts, solvency, and advocacy, um, if you have offense in terms of education or value to life, you link. Um, so I guess the advice here is you're not gonna de-link from psychoanalysis. It links to itself. If they solve their impacts, they have envisioned themselves as like within wholeness, right? Or as having achieved something or progressed despite what they will say when you say that. Um, so I would say, don't, don't bother trying to de-link. You might link turn, um, but you're not gonna de-link because it links to everything. The impacts, um, kind of classics, resentment, value to life, um, psychological violence, um, things like existential despair, depression, anxiety, pathology, neurosis, um, a unique, a, there are some unique impacts in um, this shell that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so then we get the alt. So it's pretty tough to have an alt that solves an impact when your thesis is that all of our desires to like have things or do things are like your thesis problematizes that. Um, and so any kind of psychoanalytic alt is gonna be a variation of like either active or passive nihilism. So it might be like embracing the lack, which um, is usually a kind of active nihilism. The distinction being that um, you kind of, so an active nihilist would say, oh my God, everything's meaningless. It's hopeless. We can't fix anything. So we can just kind of do what we want and we should just do those things without an expectation that they will work um, to avoid resentment. A passive nihilist says, oh wow, there's no meaning and nothing will work and we're doomed. So I guess that kind of sucks, damn. Um, so I will say I read the alternative card um, that I like saw in the file and it really does like kind of walk the line between being it like it could be explainable as either kind of nihilism. Um, but the distinct or the kind of distinct feature of this card is that it does say that they reject the idea of progress and also of knowledge as progress. Um, so I think depending on the kind of app you're reading, this is either something that you impact turn, um, i.e. like existence sucks, we should aim for progress. Their like framing claims are nonsense and like they're kind of ignoring the material violence that people face in the status quo. Or if you're reading kind of more POMO type AF um, or I guess just more critique leaning in general, um, you can just perm that shouldn't really like problematize your solvency, right? And certainly um, the relink kind of justifies the permutation um, because they won't be able to solve their impacts without linking to the critique in the same way that they have said you link the critique. Anyway, so unique aspects of Berkeley Prep's takes on psychoanalysis. Whoa, I went too far, there we go. Um, so the tags are very pretty and postmodern. Don't stress them. They're pretty much nonsense. Look at the actual text of the cards to distinguish which arguments are being made. Um, the only thing that I would say that you should use those quotes for is if you want to use them to derive a link. For instance, there's a Zizek quote. Again, I'll talk about author indicts later. Um, there are quotes about Sisyphus. You know, if you've got a link to one of those things, go for it, but don't stress it. They don't, they're not gonna like pull out a quote from one of the tags in like the 2NC and be like, they dropped this, 
you lose. There's nothing in there that I saw at least that would cause that to be possible. Um, other unique things, uh, the McGowan, one of the McGowan cards has a climate change can't be solved by politics argument with kind of a cap indict. Um, and then makes the argument that kind of their thesis explains how climate change is able to happen, which might enable a root cause argument. Um, also, there is a characterization of the subject as a paranoid um, or a paranoid as paranoid or as within paranoia. Um, so what I will say about the shell, they have a very strong and like convincing and well fleshed out critique of um, politics, political positivism, progress, knowledge. Um, and so my advice, if you are debating against the strat would be think about those things um, and think about where your authors stand and what stances you want to take um, before you get into the round, because those are going to be the places um, where the most offense will be derived. So my hot takes. So in relation to the things I just said, um, I think it's important to note with this like climate change argument that they can't derive offense from it. And the reason for that is if they solve climate change, it's a double turn because they have their, remember their link structure is like you desire blank or solve blank. So if they solve climate change, they have created an imaginary um, where they are able to like progress towards um, the resolution of an impact. Um, so it's like the exact kind of structure that they criticize the will to wholeness, the will to having um, been able to complete um, a political project or a social project. Um, the other thing um, on the paranoia argument, I think I have a slide about this. Wait, let's see. I do. Um, okay, so on this paranoia argument, um, I think there's a very easy like ableism or pathologization argument to be made here. Um, so they characterize the subject as a paranoid and they explain that paranoia is something that is aligned with a right-wing political agenda. Um, so I guess a couple of things. The first is paranoia or a paranoid schizophrenia, um, paranoid personality disorder. These are like um, diagnostic statistical manual, like diagnoses. Um, so particularly when they pose as psychologists or as like psychoanalysts to characterize what is like classified as a mental illness as in line with like the right, the like right wing or, or the right wing political agenda is really violent, right? Like there's nothing about being a paranoid schizophrenic that means that you are like a fascist, but that kind of conflation um, is something that leads to material um, examples of ableism um, and like violence. So, Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go back slide. So um, a hot take that I have um, is that a lot of the generic answers we see to psychoanalysis are a lot more valid than they're giving credit for. They're just very underexplained and misused. Um, so I'm gonna spend a second with falsifiability and author indicts um, because these are very common answers and they are underutilized. So first is falsifiability. As a psych major, um, this, is one of my biggest pet peeves. So if you're gonna read this, know what it says and what it means, right? Falsifiability is the question of, can a test be conducted which would yield results that could disprove a theory? So is it possible to conduct an empirical analysis or test that would be able to disprove the theory? Why does it matter that psychoanalysis is not falsifiable? And so this is where the internal link is often missing, is that they have proposed a theory that is not just like, you know, like a philosophical or critical theory in like the more traditional sense, say that air quotes, but a psychological theory, a theory that is and has been used to treat patients in a medical context, which makes this lack of falsifiability a violation of medical ethics, of research ethics, of like all, all kinds of fun things, right? Because with this kind of standard that they have now, I mean, they basically said we don't need to be able to prove that the things that we use to treat mental patients of mental illness or even just in general don't need to be provable. Um, so where did my notes go? Um, so this means basically like the TLDR, medical ethics is now app offense if you would like it to be. Um, so things like, and I'm completely forgetting the name of this treaty, um, but the treaty that was written right after World War II that was like medical experimentation 
it's like bad, right? That contains um, sections about like falsifiability and like the ability to like actually know that you are helping your subjects because like that is what the burden of falsifiability is, is that you can prove that the intervention that you are using is actually going to fix something or make somebody's quality of life better. And that's something that they cannot uphold. So they are responsible for proving why we should allow medical treatments that cannot be proven to actually help the patients. Um, that doesn't mean you have to read falsifiability, but if you're gonna do it, make sure you impact it out. Um, on, in terms of author indicts, so I'm not gonna walk all the way down the rabbit hole of like the particular things that Freud, Lacan, and Zizek have done that make them problematic figures. What I will, if you are interested and if you're going to make these kinds of arguments, like look into it and make sure that you know what kinds of claims you're making and how they can be backed up. But what I will say is that in relation to um, kind of two things, the first is in relation to these author indicts, you have access to claims that these authors are not just like, like classically like, oh, they're bad people, but that they have, um, that their work is now implicated by things like biological essentialism, misogyny, pathologization, ableism, gaslighting, anti-queerness, transmisogyny, rape. Um, also, I, I said biological essentialism, but also like racism and the way that those things interact with each other. So the difference between a kind of useless like throwaway card that is an author indict and a action, um, an actionable or offensive author indict is that Again, they are a theory of psychology. They have already spilled over. They have already, they are already endorsing something that has been and is currently being used to treat patients, which means that they are responsible for de defending um, the historical material violence of their theory or explaining why they don't link to those things. And so that means that link specificity, um, i.e. the paranoia argument um, is really important. So as opposed to reading author indicts as like independent reasons to vote them down, um, these are things that might serve as warrants. So for instance, if you're reading this um, paranoia pathologization DA, right, you can explain like there is no D-link. Their thesis claim, their author's arguments are foundationally tied to the kind of pathologization that produces these arguments, i.e. Um, like the way that psychoanalysts um, psychoanalysts have figured the um, like irrationality of the quote neurotic as someone who's unable to contend with um, the separation between reality and like the symbolic as somebody who can't tell what's if what's happening to them is real um, and kind of the figure of the analyst as like the father um, as a paternalist figure um, that these things make the kind of violence that you've isolated in this DA an inevitability when you've adopted their frame, which means that like, not only have you problematized a particular instance of this, but you've explained now why this is a larger reason to reject the framing of the critique, right? So that's kind of, again, in my mind, the shift between having an author indict and using your author indict to bolster and explain um, the offense that you're making against particular pieces of the critique. Um, the last major thing that I'll say in terms of like particular arguments that I think might be strategic is the concept of treatment DA. So they've, again, read a theory of psychology, sound like a broken record, right? So then there's a question, who is the analyst? Who is doing the analysis? Is it your opponents? Is it the judge? Um, in either case, I can almost promise you that neither of those people are qualified to give psychoanalytic treatment. And if your opponents have figured the judge that way, the judge has not consented to be an analyst. If you are being analyzed, you have a right to refuse treatment. So did you consent to being psychoanalyzed? I'm guessing you did not, right? And so again, you have this medical ethics argument. Um, there's a trivialization argument, right? Like this is actually a field that exists and people are trying to use it to help people. And they're kind of just like tossing it around as if they can pose as the analyst, as if anybody can be a psychoanalyst, as if it, it, like they are delegitimizing their own argument that way. Um, the same kinds of like author indict arguments that I was bringing up. So like ableism, misogyny, anti-queerness, right? There is a particular form of violence to non-consensual analysis or psychoanalysis, especially when you are a member of a group of people who has faced violence from psychoanalysis. So like there are like in-depth historical examples of like misogyny, anti-queerness and ableism that have been a result of the use of psychoanalysis as a form of treatment. And 
in presuming to be able to analyze the AF um, and in not like consensually analyzing the debaters on the um, on the affirmative side, um, they have again recreated this kind of like paternalist and incredibly violent um, uh, power. I'm not looking for the word power structure, but more like relationship um, or like hierarchy. And again, you can author indict explain this, i.e. Um, this is an inevitable result of the way that like the analyst is placed in like a hierarchical position of mastery, which probably relinks to decay and double turns their arguments. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, I think um, the other thing you can like kind of pull out of this is the um, medicalization argument that like whatever argument the AF has made, they have taken it from like, we've made a debate argument or like we've made a socio-political argument and they have said, yeah, and you need medical treatment because your argument is that bad or ridiculous or links. Like they have not said like, we disagree with your frame. They have said your subject, like your personal characterization as a subject has rendered this project impossible and you need psychoanalytic medical treatment in order to fix that. They're going, I'm, I presume Berkeley Prep is not going to be like, yes, we did say that. So your job, if you're going to make that kind of argument is to explain that like their intent in terms of like analysis is not what is important. What is important is the, the, the action of the 1NC in relation to the 1N, 1AC is the act of like, it has assumed the position of the analyst, regardless of whether or not they meant to do that, that is what they have done, right? Um, okay, I think I think one more slide, yeah. Okay, so a couple other quick vibes and then I'll, um, I'll peace out. Um, a permutation that I think is competitive, or not competitive, but like viable that I've not, I haven't seen anybody else do is like, okay, fine, do the AF and like reject the hope that it will solve. Who knows? Maybe it won't solve. Like, do it anyway. Why not? Um, against um, like identity-based chaos, or I guess just like arguments about structural violence in general, there's a very, very convincing victim blaming argument that is like explicitly um, kind of fleshed out in their McGowan evidence um, in one of one of the McGowan cards, um, which says that um, like kind of explains the death drive and um, Joyce as the enjoyment of trauma. And the enjoyment of trauma is so intensely victim blaming, right? How can they presume to tell people who have like suffered um, against like genocide, structural violence, racism, um, all of these things that they enjoy the position of the victim. That's like not very much not okay. And then similarly, who are they to say that your desire to not live under those structures is something that like, what is functionally? I mean, look at Freud, Lacan and Zizek, what a bunch of like old and or dead white philosophers who are not in occupancy of that structural position. Who are they to tell you that you cannot desire a different world, right? Um, there's reps offense, Google around. Freud did very problematic things. Zizek is an accelerationist. He said, vote for Trump. He said the N-word. Do with that information what you will. Um, I already said any alt solvency is a double turn. Um, keep in mind that this is like a piece of critical theory that is situated within the history of critical theory, which means that like, for instance, Deleuze and Guattari are writing a direct answer, like the quote that a schizophrenic out for a walk is a better like model than a neurotic on an analyst's couch is a direct response to the analyst in psychoanalysis, right? So look over anti-Oedipus if you're reading anything that is Deleuzian, um, Moten and Harney also will allow you to make these like same kinds of answers. Something like perm mutation do schizoanalysis, which I don't have time to fully flesh out right now, um, but would absolutely be um, like competitive. Um, the kind of final TLDR of all of these things is with the knowledge that you have of the arguments that are being made, think deeply about what your authors have said and perhaps like the historical context in relation to these arguments that your authors are situated within and which concepts you need to defend and what your stance is on things like psychology, um, political progress, subjectivity, desire, et cetera, right? 
Um, but don't get super freaked out by like the long tags and the trolley cross sex answers um, because when it comes down to it, this is pretty close to just a regular psychoanalysis shell with a lot of bells and whistles in the one in C. Good luck, have fun, and to Berkeley Prep KZ, if you are watching this, um, good show. Nice job. Bye.